Dr. Mary Harb Sheets, Chairperson of the Board of Psychology Licensure Committee. And I would like to call the meeting to order and ask Ms. Pruteau to call uh, to call the roll and establish a quorum. Good morning. Harb Sheets? Here. Nystrom? Here. Tate? Here. Roll is complete. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to welcome you to today's licensure committee meeting. Before we move to public comment for items not on the agenda, I just would like to share a few logistical items. Please turn your cell phones and other devices to silent, and also please mute your device that you're listening in on unless you are speaking. If you're attending today's meeting and would like pro continuing professional development credit, Ms. McCochran will let us know how that will be arranged during her report on continuing education. As indicated, we have allowed allocated time for public comment for items not on the agenda at the beginning of our meeting. And additionally, we welcome public comments on any item on the agenda. It is the committee's intent to ask for public comments prior to taking action on any agenda item. We believe public comments are instrumental to our meetings and add to the vibrant discussion on matters before the committee. If you're making a public comment, please do not identify any licensee or registrant of the board by name in order to avoid prejudicing future action that may be required of board members in our capacity as a deliber deliberative body in enforcement proceedings. Also, please be respectful of our time constraints and the need to conduct and complete the committee's business. If there are several members of the public seeking to comment on an item not on the agenda or on a particular agenda item, I will set a time limit on each speaker to ensure maximum participation by all in the context of a busy agenda. Now I would like to ask the moderator to please open the box for public comment for items not on the agenda. This is the moderator. The Q&A feature is now open. The instructions will be on the screen shortly. If you would like to participate, please, please click on the question mark inside of the square, which is typically located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen. There you go. So the instructions are on your screen for your reference. And once that text box appears, type the word comment inside and make sure it goes to all panelists before clicking the send button. You can also participate in public comment by raising your hand. So if you're logged in, you can access the hand raise feature by opening the panelist list or the participant panel and clicking the outline by hovering the cursor over your name and the outline of a hand will appear. If you are only calling in and not logged in, you can raise your virtual hand by pressing star three. At this time, I don't see any requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. Okay, again, I would like to welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Board of Psychology Licensure Committee. Um, as I've described, you will have an opportunity to comment on each agenda item we will be discussing during the open session of our meeting, and we will take public comment prior to acting on any agenda item. We will now meet in open session as noted on the agenda, and then we'll move into closed session to discuss and consider qualifications for licensure. We will not be discussing any items in open session after the closed session of business concludes, except to adjourn the meeting. 
Okay, we will move on to item number four, which is approval of the licensure committee meeting minutes from our meeting on July 22nd, 2022. Are there any comments from committee members? No, this is Leah Tate and I would like to move to approve. Okay, second. Uh, this is Julie Nystrom and I second. Okay. Um, let's add, open for public comment again, please, before we take a vote. This is the moderator. The Q&A feature is now open. Instructions are on the screen for your reference. Simply click that question mark inside of the square, type comment, send it to all panelists. Or if you're calling in, press star three to raise your virtual hand. No requests. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Please do. And Ms. Proto, would you call the roll for the vote? Harb Sheath. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Tate. Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will move on to the staff reports and start with the licensing report, which is agenda item five. Good morning, committee members. For the licensing reports, we have a couple of brief updates, which include the build of the new online application that allows psychologists to place their license and retire status. The application is now available through Breeze as well as a paper application on the board's website. We also made updates to the request to conform changes related to continuing professional development, which previously was known as continuing education regarding psychologist application. Uh, I'm sorry, psychologist renewal. Then again. We want to attachment A when comparing the data to the report made at the November board meeting. We have 58 more licensed psychologists who are in current status and 40 less who are in the inactive status. For registered psychological associates, we have 49 more current psychological associates than the report made at the November board meeting. And attachment B, you will the application workload report for both psychologists and registered psychological associates. We observe that the number of applications for the most recent month reported on the graph, which is November 2022, it shows a slight decrease overall application under psychologists. Um, we're not quite exactly sure why, but it could possibly be due to the beginning of the holiday season because in comparison to the application workload from November 2021, there was not a major difference in the data. And attachment C, it provides the number of the new application and notification received in the last 12 month period. And comparison to the same 12 month period and 2021, I'm sorry, 2022, 2021, there is an increase of 74 psychologist application, 233 psychological associate application, and 224 notification. And to specify the notification, it includes the request to change supervisor or service location for a registered psychological associate. Okay. And attachment D, uh, that's the last attachment. It provides a six month overview of average application processing timeframe and business days. The processing timeframe are available and updated on the board's website approximately every two weeks. The monthly average application processing timeframe provided on attachment D are based on the first set of data collected for that month. And for the average processing timeframe, it shows a decreased trend for the six month timeframe provided in the attachment. Uh, for both psychologists and psychological associate application and requests. And we really think that the implementation of the short term and the beginning stage of the long term solution previously presented at the August and board meeting has contributed to the reduced average processing time frame. All right, then that will conclude the licensing report. I will be glad to answer any questions. Well, let me again congratulate the licensing unit and everybody who has worked so hard on the staff, it's amazing, I mean, to see the processing time pretty much cut in half. And um, I 
I appreciate it as a psychologist and as a board member. And just I'm sure that we hear from other of the stakeholders who feel the same. And thank you. Thank you again. I know it's taken a lot of effort uh, on the part of the entire board staff. Any uh, committee members, would you like to make any comments or ask any questions? Not at this time, but congratulations on the amazing effort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, let's please open the box for public comment on the licensing report. This is the moderator. The Q&A is now open. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, click the question mark inside of the square, type comment, and send that to all panelists. If you're calling in, you can press star three from your phone to raise your virtual hand. At this time, I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Okay, we will move on to item 5B, which is our continuing education and renewals report. Ms. Cochran. Hi, good morning. My name is Lizelle and I am the CPD and renewals coordinator and I will be presenting the CPD and renewals update. The pass rate for January 2022 through June 2022 CE audits is 73% with 26% of psychologists failing the CE audit. The main reason cited for failing the audit was mostly related to concerns around the COVID-19 pandemic, such as office closures and inability to access or reproduce certificates, or an assumption that the live requirement was waived. The pass rate from 2017 to 2021 has been consistently over 80%. The pass rate for second audits have been, 80 have been over 80% since 2017, with a 100% pass rate in 2021 and 2022. For renewals processed in 2022, 80% of psychologists renewed as active approximately 91% of psychologists and psychological associates renewed their license online using Breeze. I'm going to provide an update on CPD. I first wanted to provide some background on why CPD was created. So back in 2012, the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards presented a new model of continuing education, the Continuing Professional Development Model. That same year, the legislature wanted to know the board's efforts in continuing competency. The board's response to this was that it was working to replace the single requirement of traditional continuing education courses with a more robust continued competency model. Thus, CPD was born. This model consists of 15 continuing professional development activities grouped under four different categories. CPD is a broader concept referring to the continuing development of the multifaceted abilities needed for quality professional performance in one's area of practice. I am now going to provide some actions the board has taken and will take to notify licensees and stakeholders of the new requirements. The board has posted and emailed the CPD information. Web pages on the board's website are being updated as we speak. An FAQ is being created. Uh, it will be used to clarify these requirements using questions from licensees. You can expect FAQs to be posted in February. Back in August 2022, board representatives attended an informational webinar held by the California Psychological, Psychological Association. It was very well done. Uh, the board will also be hosting our own informational webinars, which will be held on February 27th and March 3rd. I strongly suggest for licensees to subscribe to the board's email alerts for information regarding the webinars. Uh, you can do so on the board's website, which is psychology.ca.gov. Attending this licensure meeting counts for CPD credit. Your attendance is recorded when you signed in and provided your name and email address. 
please also keep record of attendance by listing today's date, the name of the meeting, which is the licensure committee meeting, and the number of hours attended. So one full day of board or committee meeting equals six hours credited. And then for board or committee meetings that are less, are three hours or less, one hour of attendance equals one hour credited. This concludes my CPD and renewals report. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, hey, um, committee members, do you have any questions for Ms. McCracken? This is Ms. Nystrom. Um, one question that I have is, is I'm curious um, if, if there's steps that um, we can take to improve um, the um, the auditing, uh, you know, performance measures. Twenty six percent seems like, um, you know, sort of a, a high number of of um, incomplete uh, CE requirements. Um, are there thoughts um, on on how we can improve that number? Yeah, I think from talking with those who have failed. The reason the COVID-19, um, that pandemic, that confused a lot of them um, because they didn't know if there was live requirements um, and then they weren't able, they met, you know, they kept their certificates in their office. Um, and another one is uh, their information wasn't updated on our file in our files. So I've been letting everyone know to make sure that they have current information with the board so that they can uh, receive all our um, letters. Um, we could also post it on our website on the CPD page. Okay, that might be um, that might be uh, something that's helpful. Uh, the more places they can see it, um, licensees can see it. That that may be that may be helpful. Um, hopefully, now that we're coming out of uh, the emergency, uh, uh, those those CE uh, certifications will be easier to obtain. In. Thank you. And um, this is Dr. Harbsheets, Ms. Nystrom. I think we have also talked about in the past maybe putting um, a little blurb in the newsletter that the board sends out just reminding people of keeping track of their certificates and um you know no, for example no longer the live requirement just some of the information that can help that might be unique to any particular situation that we're dealing with i think that's helpful as well thank you sure Hey, could um, we please open the box for public comment on the continuing education and renewals report? This is the moderator. The Q and A is now open. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you would like to participate, click on the question mark inside of the square, type comment, and send it to all panelists. If you're calling in and wish to participate, press star three from your phone to raise your virtual hand. So have a few individuals who would like to participate. I'll start with uh, just a moment. Patricia Masuda Story. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. I will send a request to unmute your microphone from your end. Make sure to click unmute me once I send that request. And sorry, I will send a request in just a moment. Request sent. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, the big question that I have ever since I got the email um, about the CPD, was there any consideration for people, psychologists who graduated during the 1990s when APA requirement was not actually required and when the private when when your private schools were approved by the California private post-secondary vocational uh, institutions it seems like this new way of doing uh, units the CPD 
is very discriminatory for people who, were, who graduated before the requirements were put into place. Um, this is Dr. Harpsheets. And can you um, explain a little bit more what you're thinking about it being discriminatory? I, um, I know I graduated in the early 90s also, and I do remember that there were no continuing education requirements. And then that came in for us, I think, soon after we were that's, licensed, right? No, that's not what I'm talking about. You must have, uh, okay, I graduated in 97. The okay. school, my school elected not to um, go APA because back in the 90s, APA wanted $141,000 for the annual sticker. So the school said, no, we're not going to do that. But we are approved by the Cal California Private Post-Secondary vo and Vocational uh, System. Then came in Governor um, Schwarzenegger, who was like, oh, let's do away with that. Now we had a problem because then it became, how do we get verifications of our schools? Okay, enter Jerry Brown again, who brought in a modified version of that. And it, it's better, but it still has been a nightmare since. In 2016, <clears throat> the board had issued out a page that stated, okay, now schools have to be AP approved, WASC approved, or whatever. Great, but for the people who graduated from 1990, at least in my case, 1997 to 2016, and we do not have entry into AATBS or whatever it is where it's like, oh, do all of your units this way, and then you don't have to do anything else above there. I feel that there's this is a discriminatory process, and now I have to go hunting to get this uh, CEU thing taken care of, including attending such meetings as this one. I, I see what you're saying. You're talking about regional accreditation for licensure, correct? Right, which was not required in 1997. Right. I, I would encourage you if to check in, maybe um, Ms. Chung, would, the, would someone from your unit be able to um, talk with Dr. Masuda's story about the, um, quest, this question that she has regarding accreditation for licensure and how it ties into CPD? Um, we can definitely reach out um, um, if uh, she may email us um, at bob, uh, licensing at dca.ca.gov so we have your contact information. Uh, that Is there way. a phone number that I can call instead? Because every time I email, I don't really get far. Uh, you can call it as well, but we won't be able to attend it until later because we're all in a meeting right now. No, I don't mean um, now, like a number that I can call for later. I don't think you guys yes. really understand what I'm trying to say. There seems to be a very discriminatory line between those who graduated from a long time ago until now, whereas the new requirements just say, oh, you can get all your CEUs done from the little comment down, from the little box down below. And for everybody else, it's like, here, find your space in the world based on all of these options that you have above. Things like webcasts and podcasts, which make absolutely no sense. Where are we going to find podcasts and webcasts that are actually creditable? Or can we just yeah. listen to anything from anywhere and it, it's suddenly going to count? Yeah, I think Dr. Um, Masuda's story, it would be really helpful. And, and uh, Ms. Chung, could you please uh, give a phone number that she can call? And then I think we can clarify that because I don't think, as I understand it, that there are any different requirements for anyone who graduated earlier when the rules were different about accreditation. Um, okay, let me let me help you understand that. Yeah. So if you take a look at the way things are broken down, and I wish I had that sheet of paper where it breaks it down. There's a certain amount of CEUs that we can take the traditional way, which I think was 27, I don't know. But then it was like, okay, now we got to go hunting for the other ones of these units, okay? So if we don't have a, if we're not teaching in a class or not taking a class or not taking in a, an intern or a, an, an, a, a psych assistant or whatever, now it's like, okay, where else are we going to go hunting for these? Okay, so we have to attend these meetings. We can't go to a to a conference anymore because whereas we could get one hour per unit, um, uh, one hour per actual hour of for one credit, now it's like the entire conference, which is a waste of time, is only going to be one credit unit, but one credit unit, it does not seem fair. Oh, you know what? Right. Let, me, let me ask Ms. McCochran. She yeah, hi. 
let her, I, she can maybe give you a little bit more information on, for example, if you could, Ms. McCochran, on the conference attendance. Right. And, and that will clarify that. But then also um, maybe talking with Ms. McCochran afterward might be a better idea to get more clarity. But Ms. McCochran, can you just speak to the, what, if somebody attends a conference, um, how, um, how do they get credit? Yeah, so for the con conference attendance, so usually in conferences, they have breakout sessions and they give you credit for those breakout sessions. Uh, so you will still be able to receive credit for those breakout sessions. So just for example, let's say attending a conference and they have four breakout sessions, two hours each, you get a total of eight, uh, eight hours, right? On top of those eight hours, just for attending that day, you can get an extra hour. Where right. is this even exemplified on that email that went out to everybody? Yeah, because you know what? I can... It looks like it's one unit for the whole day or entire conference. Right. Yeah, which it is, but that it, I, I understand what you're saying. It's failing to um, let you know that it's on top of what you've already would acquire at the conference. Okay, it's so, good to know that we can right. actually get that from the conference. We'd absolutely, I think the key phrase, and you just said it is, it is failing to let us know that. Right. Yes. So that's why we're also, thank you for letting us know, and I'll make sure we. Uh, correct this stuff in the future. And then I'm going to also give you my direct line and also for the attendees so that if you have, you know, specific questions as this, you can give me a call. So okay. let me know when you're ready to take it down. I'm ready. It's area code 916-574-8252. 916-574-8252. Yes. And then my email is bop c e so b o p c e at d c a dot c a dot g o v thank you v is in victor okay i hope that was helpful and can we please go on to the next commenter this is the moderator. Moving on to the next individual, Zoe Dorit Eliu. I apologize if I mispronounce. I'm going to send a request to unmute your microphone. Hello. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my first WebEx meeting. I'm glad you guys changed. I'm very excited about the new plan. It, it looks like it opens a lot of options for us, which... Uh, I'm very excited about and um, I, before I start, maybe uh, Miss, uh, oh, I guess we're not supposed to say the names of the people. The person who spoke last, if you could put your email address and phone number because some of us have hearing problems and uh, <laughs> I couldn't quite get the email address. So my questions are, for example, for this meeting where it says we need to add our email and license number, but I don't see where you can do that uh, so that we can get credit. So I'll start with that just as a practical and procedural question. Yeah, so when you signed, on, uh, signed into the meeting, you provided your name and your email. Um, we keep record of that and oh, that's is considered. It, oh, is it automatic? I, I never yeah. use WebEx. I typically use Zoom. So I don't, so that that has already happened, yes. in other words. Okay. And, and then doctor, when, um, if you get audited, you should keep a record for yourself. And then if you get audited, you will submit that record, which Ms. McCochran would check against her records of you having attended the meeting. So when you say records, should I just keep a, a note, a file note of, uh, of, oh, I came to this meeting or take a picture of the screen or what, what would be a sufficient record, I guess my question is. So yeah, the record should include the today's date, uh, January 13th, 2023, uh, the name of the meeting, which is the licensure committee meeting, and the number of hours attended. And so, so I'm sorry, go ahead. 
So the just the paper record. Yes. Yeah, and Miss McCochran, don't we have a um, sample record um, form on the website? Yes. So you can use it's called the CPD reporting form. I, I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, that we yeah. have. Yeah, so it's on our website. Um, and just the fastest way to get to it is go to the website and then on the search bar, type in CPD reporting form. CPD reporting form. Would that be the same um, the same form to use uh, for a peer consultation group that we're starting? Yeah, yeah, you're able to record. Uh, all of your CPD activities on that form. Okay, so the same goes for the peer. I'm very excited about the peer consultation group. That's we already we at least me and my peers uh, were forming a group, and it's it's a wonderful way to connect, especially for those of us in private practice. And uh, and uh, we're all very excited. So thank you for adding that. So we will use that form to record when we meet and what the topic is about? Yes, correct. So for that, for peer consultation, you're just going to write the dates. Uh, so the type of activity. So was it a case consultation, a reading or research group? And then the total number of hours. Okay. I, I was told it has to be minimum one hour, uh, both for individual and group. Yes, okay. a, a one hour. Yes. Okay. Now, where can we find uh, committee committees that we can join uh, so we'll be more involved in the process? Uh, if you are uh, subscribed to our email list uh, approximately two weeks before any committee meeting, you will receive an email notification of that meeting along with the agenda. And um, so that way you can get ongoing um, information about and plan for attending meetings. And our, you can attend um, our board meetings. Our next board meeting is February 2nd and 3rd. Um, so that is another, although I should ask, is that also going to be a virtual meeting as well as in person? Um, anyone who can answer that, I would appreciate. That is just in person only. Oh, okay. So we will have a separate way to verify attendance at a uh, in-person meeting. Okay. I, guess, I guess my question was more, um, are there any committees uh, that need psychologist members like an ethics committee or, you know, any, any committees? Because one of the CPD options is to join a committee. So... Is you, there, would, you would do that through your professional or associations, so locally or through California Psychological Association, okay. those right. committees, yes. Okay. All right. And I, I did also want to add that the email address is on the slide on your screen, the bopce at dca.ca.gov. That, that's yours, Miss, uh, Miss or Dr. McCorkran? Yeah, yeah, it's on the screen. Okay, I, I see it now. Thanks. Well, um, thank you. <laughs> like everything new, so it creates a bit of anxiety. Yeah, um, the change. Change is big. Not... It's a big change. So we're all sitting. Oh, what do what do they want now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm glad that we have an address and that we can. Uh, start this process. Thank Good. you. Well, thank you for attending. Um, can we move on to the next commenter, please? This is the moderator. Next individual, Joe Linder Crow. I'm going to send a request to unmute your microphone in just a moment. The request has been sent. Uh, just a friendly reminder to click the unmute me button you from me? your end. Can yes, you we me? can hear you. Thank you yes, very much. Can. Um, I'm Dr. Joe Linder Crow. I'm the CEO at the California Psychological Association. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, all of you at the board for all of the efforts. Um, we have enjoyed working with the staff to uh, maximize the educational information that's going out. And certainly for CPA members, we have provided guidance on the CPD regs, 
Um, thank you, um, Ms. McCorkin, for noting the webinars that we've done. And I think together uh, we have provided a, a extensive information. We will continue to, to do so uh, for CPA members. And I wondered um, if we might consider, and we uh, I will make this offer and we can talk about it offline, um, there may be an opportunity for us to have a an article or a short column in the California Psychologist magazine, which goes out to all of all CPA members. Um, that would be another avenue, I think, for getting information out. I have a specific question that keeps coming up, and I think we're going to get this over and over again. Um, so it, if you take this meeting, for example, the meeting is on the agenda schedule from 10 to 4, but you have said, Dr. Harpsheets, that there will be an open session and then you'll be going into closed session. Um, Ms. McCorkran, can you explain how people would deal with that and how many credits they could get for a meeting that is part open session and then mostly closed session? Thank you very much and we'll continue to look forward to working with all of you on this. Yes, that can be confusing. So yes, please, Ms. McCorkin. I asked the same question, Dr. Linder Crow, the other day. So I, I understand why it keeps coming up. And Ms. McCorkin? Hi, yes, that's a good question. Um, so it's the total amount of time that the meeting took from the opening to adjournment. Um, is saying all the way through. Um, so like when they go through closed session, you could just stay on or usually they provide a time like when they anticipate to be back, um, just as long as you're back and staying through the till, till adjournment. And then with the hours for that. So let's say that in total um, that this committee meeting was six hours or one day of the committee meeting is six hours credited. And then if in total through opening to adjournment that if this meeting is three hours or less, one hour of attendance will equal one hour credited. So um, just to clarify, our meeting started at 10. Let's say we finish the open session at noon um and and so then no one else is they're on the call but they're not able to hear what's going on um i think they get bumped off the call officially is that it, if it, maybe the moderator um can confirm that but they get bumped off and then we at the end of the closed session let's say that's at, at two o'clock at the end of that closed session um, we open back up. So you're saying, Ms. McCorkran, that we can, they should stay on the phone or on their computer, and then it would be open again for them to hear, and then therefore at 2 o'clock, they would have credit from 10 to 2, which is more than three hours, so they would have six hours credit. Hi, Dr. Harpsheets. Yes, yes. Uh, th this is Jason. Uh, I'm just hoping maybe staff can have a chance to circle up on this during our next break. Uh -huh. So we can get some uh, just some clarity for uh, for everyone in the meeting. Yeah, that would be really helpful because I understood it a little bit differently. So that would be very helpful. And thank you, Dr. Linda Crow, for asking that question. Okay, do, do we have more comp people uh, wanting to make a comment or ask a question? This is the moderator. Next individual, Christopher Stack. I'm going to send a request to unmute your microphone. From your end, just click the unmute me button. Hey. We can hear you. Thank you. Uh, so some of my questions have been answered somewhat, um, but I do have some clarifying questions. <clears throat> the format for tracking the CPD hours, um, you said paper was fine, and then you talked about the CPD reporting form. I, it's my understanding that reporting form says that that's not an official record and it's for personal use. Is that accurate? Right. So that reporting form is for reference. But um, if you look at the reporting form, there's some activities that have an asterisk next to them. And so, for example, this 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 uh, conference attendant, uh, not conference, I'm sorry, committee 
meeting attendance has an asterisk next to it. And that means that this using the CPD form and recording it on there will suffice as documentation that you could submit to the board if you were audited. Okay. And that sort of segues into my next question. So the submission process for this, it's going to be similar to CEs where it's only if we're audited. It's not going to be every time we renew. Correct. So when you submit, if you were to renew online on using Breeze, which I strongly suggest because of the quick turnaround time, which is 24 hours, as opposed to the four to six weeks turnaround time, if you were to submit the paper renewal. But if you were to submit your online renewal, you have the option of uploading your CE documentation. You can upload it there. Um, but you are still required to keep record of your continuing professional development activities for four years, which is two renewal cycles. And then you would only need to furnish it to the board if you are selected for an audit. So as far as uploading the certificates, that goes to a repository kind of thing or where, when they're uploaded, I guess, where do they go and how do we access them? I don't know. I know I need to check if you are able to access them because once you upload it and you know submit the application, the board I am able to view it. This is Jason. I can add in that uh, your any certificates that are uploaded through your renewal are added to the renewal transaction. Once mm -hmm. that transaction is uh, submitted by the licensee, that there is no way to access. Uh, I don't believe the attachments anymore. Uh, so it goes. It's saved in the transaction in our Breeze system as an attachment. So in the event of an audit after that, because you already have those records, you wouldn't then ask for a copy of the records? Yeah, so I would still send you a letter to let you know that you are audited. Um, and then you could, would yes, correct, we would already have the documents, but I would still notify you that you were audit, being, are being audited. Okay, I think that's all the questions I had. Thank you. I, 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 just to be sure I understand, um, Dr. Stack, were you asking if at the renewal time, without an audit request, you wanted to submit your CPD documentation? Oh, oh, okay, yes, yes, okay. So, um, Ms. McCochran, do you want people to do that, to submit? So he, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Stack muted himself and he uh, answered uh, in writing, yes, that he wanted to just submit it anyway. So for those of you who are listening, um, and Ms. McCochran, do you want people to do that, um, to submit it without an audit request? Uh, I do recommend that they, on your renewal, um, you s upload your continuing education documents. Um, it It is fine if you don't. I don't want to make it seem like it's required, but it is an option and it may help with your record keeping. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, do we... and? Uh, I think we have some additional questions. Uh, moderator, could you please check the list? Yes, this is the moderator. I'm going to move on with call-in call user four. After that, we will go to um, Lori Strother. After Lori is Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman. And we will circle back with Zoe Dreet Eliu. So let's start here with call-in user four. I sent a request to unmute your microphone. Hi, this is Dr. Taffy Gomes from Los Angeles. And I just have a quick technical question. Um, first of all, thank you for the reporting form. I'm just wondering if it could be put in Excel format. I used to keep track of my hours. Um, in an Excel spreadsheet. And this is a much more complicated uh, thing now. So I was wondering if it could possibly put in, be put into a more electronic format. 
that would be easier to track with. Thank you. Ms. McCochran? Yeah, I will work um, with my team or with management and see what we can do. Uh, I believe we can. I just, oh, we totally can. Yes, I got word that we can. So yes, we will do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, next um, commenter, please. This is the moderator, Lori Strother. I'm going to send a request to unmute your microphone. You have been unmuted. Hi, we can sort of hear you if you could just speak okay. up a bit. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, put in the chat box my question, so I'll just read it if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I was told the board's intention is to allow people to attend virtually, even if the meeting is in person. I do not want to travel or nervously wait for a meeting to be held near me. I want to be able to consistently meet my CPD and not have to scramble trying to find alternatives to meeting attendance. I believe we were able to call in to an in-person meeting and can't we just continue this practice and find some way to check in and out. Okay, Ms. Sorek, I would appreciate it if you would respond to that question. Yeah, no problem. Um, the board is doing a combination of virtual meetings as well as in-person meetings. Um, right now, we are under um, an extension of a waiver, which would allow us uh, to have virtual meetings um, that don't require a hybrid component, meaning in-person and virtual. Um, but we will plan to continue to have virtual offerings because uh, it is a cost savings for the board. So as long as we can continue to offer that, um, all of the committee meetings are planned to be held virtually. So we have a legislative and regulatory affairs committee that meets on a regular basis uh, virtually. The licensure committee, which meets virtually, and then the board will continue to have at least one to two meetings out of the four a year um, to be held virtually. So uh, there will be plenty of virtual offerings in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. I think we have one more um, comment. This is the moderator, Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman, and after that, Zoe Duri Eliu. And I, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. So, Dr. Elizabeth, I've sent a request to unmute your microphone. You are unmuted. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Hi, it's Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman from the California Psychological Association. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done already in providing information about the continuing professional development requirements. As you can see, there's a lot of questions and um, CPA is also still having a lot of questions. So um, one thing that I would say about this is that I think that FAQs, I really appreciate that you're going to be doing those. I would be glad to collaborate and provide some questions that CPA is getting. And I would suggest, given the level of questions that you can hear at this meeting and also that I've received, I think uh, to reduce the number of calls that you're getting and questions and so forth, that um, it will be important for them to be pretty extensive and detailed. So that's one suggestion to, because um, I think there's still a lot of areas that need clarification. Another thing is regarding this option to upload people's CEs, this is a new thing. And we actually got a question about this last week or earlier this week. Um, this is new. It, people, the one person that we've heard from so far really thought it was mandatory. I think it's going to be important to clarify that it's optional. And I don't know what it looks like exactly on the uploading form, uh, on the on the form when you renew, because mine hasn't needed to be renewed and my, uh, my license won't need to be renewed for a little while. 
Um, but to make that clear, really clear, um, that it's optional. Um, and the other thing is in terms of the um, uh, documenting attendance at a board of psychology meeting, I think this is an example where it's going to be important to have uh, detailed written instructions about this because what you're saying right now is different than what is in the actual regulations. So I would have, I or any other psychologist would have no reason to know how to do this because on the regulations it says that a psychologist requesting CPD credit pursuant to this subdivision shall have signed in and out on an attendance sheet providing their first and last name, license number, time of arrival, and time of departure from the meeting. So that is just an example of like why I think a lot more information and clarification needs to go out and that perhaps there will need to be some kind of sign in and sign out sheet even for the electronic meetings that are taking place. So thank you. I'm glad to work with you. If there's any way I can help to determine what kind of information uh, psychologists need, as I said, I'll be very glad to help with that as we make this transition. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Winkleman. As usual, you provide very useful information and perspective, and I'm sure that board staff will be calling on you and uh, requesting your input on what kinds of questions are coming up. Um, okay, next uh, caller. This is the moderator. I'm going to send a request to unmute Zoe Dori Eliu. You've been sent a request. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Elu. I actually, all my questions were asked by uh, Dr. Winkleman, so uh, I will listen to your response to her. Uh, it's exactly the same questions. One more question is, there seems to be a separation between uh, the sponsored continuing education with no live anymore versus attendance of webinars. So what kind of webinars, what does that mean? How, how are those different than, say, the, the sponsored CE? Uh, it, that would be, I think, in the self-study CPD re, uh, option, um, in addition to the questions that Dr. Winkelman brought up. Thank you. So your question is, how are webinars different than sponsored CE? Is that the question? That's correct. I mean, the majority of the webinars are sponsored CE. Uh, right. So I'm not sure the differentiation between sponsored CE, but then in the self-study, there is a, a reading books, or reading an article or going to a webinar. So I'm not sure about the differentiation. Yes, so uh, Ms. McCochran, can you give an example perhaps of a webinar that might be um, something other than a sponsored CE? Yes, yeah, so for webinars, that can still be considered sponsored CE just because if you think about the old or traditional CE model, what we've been doing in the past, it has been included. Um, it, if it's still, you know, approval by APA, CPA, which, you know, then it would, can you can count it towards sponsored CE. So, you know, we're, I think people are going to be waiting for clarification through both the um, uh, meetings that the board will be holding virtually, the um, February 27th and early March, and also the FAQs that I know that we were waiting until the uh, CPD was launched uh, just because of what we're seeing today, that as it becomes launched, then these questions start to come up in detail so that we can make them as um, detailed as possible. Do we have any idea when uh, an FAQ might be um, published by the board? Yes. Yeah, great. So for the FAQs, we're planning to um, publish that in next month, early next month. 
Um, and for Dr. Winkleman, you can go ahead and shoot me the questions that you guys receive and I'll can include that in there. And then I do want to reiterate that the informational webinars are going to be held February 27th and March 3rd. And if you guys or if the attendees here have any more questions, especially uh, more specific questions about the CPD, please email me. It's on the screen and it's bopce at dca.ca.gov. Thank you. And, um and Mr. Glasspiegel, you mentioned that or a little bit earlier that maybe the staff could get together and address, um, for example, the question of uh, how many hours, for example, today's meeting might be. Um, and would you be doing, would you want to do that um, this morning and clarify that before our open session meeting is over? That would be great. If there's a, an, a, an opportunity for a short break at some point during the open session uh, where staff could huddle up, that would be great. Um, and if I could just add uh, to the last commenter's question about um, what webinars and things that would not fall under um, the traditional continuing education, we do often get um, requests from licensees to check if a course meets our CPD or our CE requirement and maybe it's a course offered out of like let's say or a webinar from Texas that has meets the Texas licensure requirements but doesn't meet the California requirements or it's one in another country or um, you know just ones that don't have like APA CPA um, you know ACCME AMA period category one type credits associated with them um, that is the opportunity for the, this, those windows if for um, the self-directed learning uh, can, can fall into kind of those category, that category for some of those webinars. Oh, that's a good distinction. So that would, instead of being called sponsored CE, it would be self-directed learning. Exactly. Self-directed learning is kind of anything that doesn't fit into the categories, plus anything that a psychologist might think is uh, is related to the practice of psychology, so long as they can they can justify it. Um, but that is exactly a place for those types of uh, webinars. Okay. Um, okay. So before we move on to the examination report, I just wanted to ask our committee members if you had any other comments or questions that you would like to bring up on the continuing education and renewals report. This is this Leah Tate. I don't have any questions or comments, but I do appreciate um, everyone contributing and um, coming together to try and work it out. Thank you. I mean, this is Ms. Nystrom, and uh, I would just echo what um, Dr. Tate said. Appreciate uh, all of the, all of the feedback. Thank you. Great. Okay, what we'll do is we'll hear the examination report, which is agenda 5C, and then we will take a short break, which will give the staff time to get together, come back and answer for us that really important question about how do we, how do we count hours for committee meetings, particularly when there's a closed session component. And I think that will come up with board meetings also. Okay, Ms. Snyder, could you share with us the examination report? Good morning, everyone. So my name is Lavinia Snyder, uh, the examination coordinator for the board. So next item on the agenda is the examination report. Um, so the, uh, the board uh, requires two exams the examination for professional practice in psychology and the California psychology laws and ethics exam. The EPPP is the national exam developed by the Association for Provisional and Psychology Boards and it's administered by Pearson View. The exam tests candidates general knowledge in psychology. So what you have are statistics right now at the time that uh, the, this report was created, I only had January to November uh, uh, data available at that time. So, so I just recently pulled uh, December's uh, numbers. So the overall pass rate changes from 40%, which was initially reported, to 38.89 or 
And then the first time pass rate, uh, that changes from 62% to 61.33%. Those numbers include December's uh, data. So the next chart uh, that you will see is the um, this uh, pass rate statistics for the EPPP for the past three years, uh, 2020, 21, and 2022. Uh, so you will note at the beginning of 2022, you will see a downward trend of pass rates uh, compared to the past years. Candidates did slightly better in August and November of this year compared to August and November of 2021. So the next exam is the CPLEE, which is a state-owned exam, uh, by the, and it's uh, developed by the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination Services and administered by PSI, Inc. Um, so the overall pass rate uh, so uh, for this year, this includes December's uh, data, is at 76.68%. And the overall first time pass rate for the year 2022 is 77.82%. Uh, and if you look at the chart for the past three years, uh, CPLE pass rates uh, seem to be consistent over the past three years with no noticeable deviation. Okay. So, and that concludes my report. Does anyone have questions? Yes, committee members, do you have any questions? This is Ms. Nystrom. I'm curious if there's a national uh, pass rate that we have for the EPPP. And if California is, you know, where California is in comparison. Um, Ms. Um, they did. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay, well, uh, we did provide uh, data back in. Um, when was that? I think in August of 2022. Um, and that's pretty much data for uh, that shows how um, uh, what the pass rates were for non APA accredited and APA accredited programs. And then we also they did that for at the national level. And they also did one for us for California. So just to look at the national numbers at that time when they provided it, uh, it says national pass rate for first time pass takers have been around 82% for candidates from accredited programs and around 55% for candidates for non-accredited programs with a combined first time pass rate of around 75%. That's the national. So for, um, for California, uh, for accredited programs, first-time pass rate is at 71% and non-accredited programs uh, at 41% pass rate. Okay, so for the accredited programs, it's significantly higher, the pass rate. Um, okay, um, I, I do recall we had that conversation in August too. Um, I guess it just, yeah. every time I see it, I keep thinking, ooh, ouch. So, okay, thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> a reminder, sure. California is one of the few states in the United States that does allow for licensure for people graduating from regionally accredited, but not APA accredited programs. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other, Dr. Tate, do you, are you, do you have a question or anything? I have no comments at this time. Thank you. Great. Okay. Could we open the box for any public comments or questions? This is the moderator. The Q&A is now open. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, click the question mark inside of the square, typically located bottom right corner of your WebEx screen. For those calling in, press star three from your phone to raise your virtual hand. You have individual identified as Boyd King Dennett. I'm going to send a request to unmute your microphone in just a moment. And from your end, just click the unmute me button. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Hi, um, good, good morning. I just have a question in terms of um, where we are in terms of the status of um, the EPPP part two. 
as a state? Oh, we will talk about, we are going to, in item number eight, we okay. will cover that in today's agenda. Okay, thank you. Sure. This is the moderator. No further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Okay. It is 11.04. Um, if we take a break until 11.15, uh, Mr. Glassbeagle, will that give the staff enough time to clarify the question that was asked about credit, CPD credit for meetings? I believe that should be great. Okay, we will come back at 11.15. This is Dr. Hark Sheets, and it is 11.15. So we will come back from our break. Mr. Glassbeagle, um, could you update us on the conversation you had with the staff regarding the uh, question about credit, CPD credit for meetings? Dr. Harp Sheets, you want me to, might want to establish that everyone's back. Oh, thank you, Dr. Tate. Yes, um, Ms. Proto, could you please call the roll again? Yes, uh, Harb Sheets. Uh, here. Nystrom. Here. Tate. Here. Thank you, roll is complete. Hi, Dr. Harb Sheets, this is Jason. Um, yes, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. McCochran to provide an update. Thank okay. you so much. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you for that, yes. so. The intention of this is uh, we will give credit for open session, the time of when we are in open session, uh, you'll receive credit. So if again, if it's less, if it's three hours or less, you will be credited for every hour that you're attended. And then if it's the full day, um, it's six hours credit. So if it was four hours, uh, it would be six hours credit. Correct, yes. Okay, okay. Let me open, let us open the comment box again, just to be sure there that doesn't um, generate any additional questions. This is the moderator. The Q&A is open. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, click on the question mark inside of the square, typically bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type the word comment in the text field that appears and send it to all panelists. For those who are calling in, you can press star three from your phone to raise your virtual hand. I have an individual, Patricia Masuda Story. I'll send a request to unmute your microphone in just a moment. Request has been sent. Just click the unmute me button. Okay, so just to confirm, we are not getting credit for when you go into closed session. Just want to verify that. Yes. Oh, and I see here that Elizabeth has already studied that it's already been verbally answered. Okay, yes, that is correct. That is correct. No, this is the moderator. No further requests. Oh, actually, sorry, just one came in. Zoe Duri Eliu sending a request to unmute your microphone. Click the unmute me from your end. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand the answer. So today's meeting, is it all open meeting or is there a portion that's closed meeting? Yes, uh. it, it is both an open and closed meeting. And uh, when we get through the agenda uh, through item eight, we will um, move into closed session. At that point, at closed session, we only come back after closed session to not take any additional agenda items, but just to adjourn the meeting. So at whatever time we finish item eight and end the open session of the meeting, that is when you will calculate how many um, hours you get. So I think that does bring up another question. It is 1118 and let's say that we finish the meeting at 1145. That would be um, two hours and 45 minutes. So um, Ms. McCochran, would they round to three hours?
Is there? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. You, yeah. If it's two hours, 45 minutes, you could round to three. Is there a way to simplify this and um, tell us ahead of time and have a signage sheet uh, or like a simpler way that we can uh, say, okay, I went to this meeting. This is my proof that I went. I signed in. I signed out. Uh, is there a way to simplify it, I guess? Um, well, let me go back and correct myself. It was it would be two um, two hours instead of three when I was saying earlier because we started at 10 o'clock today. Um, in terms of simplifying for a virtual meeting like this, the um, the your the times and the names and emails are being recorded, so that um, you it would just Ms. McCochran would just compare what she is given from Solid, which would track this, to what you might submit, and I, that sounds pretty simple to do. Um, I can't think of anything else that would make it any simpler. But if anybody else can, I'm certainly open. I think we're open to hearing that. I get. I guess my confusion is when I first wrote to the board about this meeting, I was told I will get six hours. I'm using this meeting as an example because there's going to be more meetings. That's good. That's good. Uh, so it's not about this meeting in particular. Yeah. <laughs> So now I'm hearing actually that instead of six hours, they will be getting two hours. Yeah, so. I I think you're right. I think we're all using this meeting as the first example. And it, I think the bottom line is we could get up to six hours, but we can't really predict how long an agenda um, might, an open session of an agenda might take. And some committees I don't think have closed sessions either but it's hard to predict we don't know what questions are going to come up and um what the a discussion around those might be so um it, i'm sorry it's it's hard to predict on that and no, I think it's that's okay it's okay i i'm just trying to clarify so so uh after you guys close, we can log out and give ourselves a two hour credit. Uh, is that the bottom that's, line? Yeah, that's true. If we, if we close within two, the open session within two hours, that's true. Okay. And then because actually for meetings, we can do up to eight hours, if I'm not mistaken, uh, attending WebEx meetings. Um, I would ask Ms. McCochran, I thought it was up to six because the board meetings are the ones that are typically longer and they would go up to six. But Ms. McCochran? Yeah, so for the attendance at a California Board of Psychology meeting for that CPD activity, you can do a maximum of eight hours in that activity. Um, and then so one day of the board or committee meeting is six hours credited. And then if the committee meeting or board meeting is three hours or less, you'll get one hour of attendance for each so the hour. Eight, the eight hours comes in for a maximum that can be used during the two hour um, renewal period. Is that what you're saying? The two year renewal period, yes, yes. Yeah, two, two years, sorry, mm -hmm. yes. So, so they can, and is that maximum of eight hours for board and committee altogether? Correct. So, so that's what I thought. It's up to eight hours, but even though today this is a six hour meeting, we get credited only for two. Maybe when we come, somebody can tell us how many hours can we get. So we record accurately and there's no discrepancy between what you guys have on your records and what we have on our record yes. because of this confusion. That's a really good idea. That's a good um, idea. So if, if somebody can say, okay, you're here, we blah, blah, blah. But for today, you're going to get two hours. So we can go to our little form and two hours. Because, see, after I send the question to the board, 
And they said six hours, I would have put in six hours. And then if I get audited, there would be a discrepancy between what you guys have and what I have, uh, no one's fault, you know? Yes, that's a great idea that, you know, at the end, and um, Ms. McCochran, um, what do you think of the, whoever is chairing the meeting to, and if, if it's virtual, we have people in to announce at the end of the meeting, the um, uh, availability of a CPD credit, the amount of hours. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea um, just at the end of open session to let everyone know how many hours they'll be credited in. That would be so awesome. Thank you. Because I, to me, this is a little confusing. Yeah. Um, any? Do any other staff people have any um, comment you'd like to make on um, asking chair people or the board president to make that. And we've got the board president on this committee. So um, Dr. Tate, if you'd like to say something about that too. I think you're definitely headed the right direction, Dr. Harpsheets. Um, I, I appreciate the confusion because I understand the confusion. So I think after the end of the meeting, it'd be nice to, to hear from the person chairing the committee. Uh, this is Antoinette. Um, I will make sure that um, as part of the opening in um, the meeting and the closing of the meeting, because either board or committee meetings are going to count towards continuing professional development, that there will be a clarification of how uh, attendance will be noted. And then at the end, there will be a snapshot for how many hours will be credited for any participants in whatever relevant meeting, be it virtual or in person. So we'll make sure that that's uh, covered. And this was a great testing ground to start with a committee meeting that is virtual so we can troubleshoot some of these things um, for future meetings. So I appreciate you all hanging in there and being patient with us as this is a new territory for the board. Yes, definitely. I think all of these questions have been so helpful for us. Okay. Let us move on to item number six, which is the board response to psychologist applications. Chair, this is the moderator. I apologize for interrupting. There was another individual with a hand up and another individual with a question. Would you like us to address those? Yes, please, please. Thanks. And in the Q&A box, if I dismissed your um, comment, we do ask that you type in comment and we will unmute your microphone and you can then speak. So if I dismissed and you still have a public comment, please go back in and enter comment and send it so we can um, address you. Um, but we'll move on to Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman and after that calling user four. So Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman, I'm gonna send a request to unmute your microphone. Hi, thanks. My, my question was already answered verbally. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to next individual, call in user four, sending a request to unmute your microphone. Hi, just a quick question uh, that may have been already answered, just to clarify, if you have to leave early and you can't stay for the whole meeting, can you get credit for like the hour that you were there? Oh, Ms. McCochran, you can tell us perhaps what solid will show. Yeah, so that's a good question that I feel I, I would need, I would want to circle back to this one. Um, but yes, yeah, solid provides us. So solid is the moderator of this WebEx meeting um, and they provide us with an attendance sheet um, and the attendance sheet has your name, your email and your sign in and sign out. Um, now, if you don't, if you sign out before the meeting has ended, um, let me get back to you on that information. 
Okay. And I, I presume that information will probably be such a good question, be included in the FAQs also. Oh, for sure. Yes. Great. Okay. I have um, another hand that just um, went up from calling user seven, sending a request to unmute microphone. Hi, this is Thomas Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, this has been so informative. Thank you. Um, I had another question just about attendance um, verification for call-in users um, where we did not enter our name and email, but instead called in. I suppose it will record the phone number, which we can use to verify. And that's my question. Thank you. Yes. Ms. McCochran, would you like to um, validate that answer? Yeah, I will work with um, Solid to see what information, how that can work, like what that will be provided with the just with the phone number. Um, if you can, for just for the purpose of this meeting, if you did call in, could you just email me with your name, um, and I can and the number that you used to call in, so that I could verify it against the attendance sheet. And then we can see in future meetings how we're gonna, how we can work that uh, for Collins. This is the moderator. No further requests. Would you like me to close the Q and A feature? Yes, please do. Thanks. Okay. Um. Ms. Chung, could you introduce us to I, agenda item number six, board response to psychologist applications? Yes, thank you, Dr. Harpsheets. Um, this item um, is about the correspondence templates um, that licensing staff use uh, in communicating with our um, applicants um, that are applying uh, for their psychologist license or um, to take the exam. Um, so these correspondent templates um, contain important information about um, uh, next steps or uh, the status of their application. Um, and these include uh, results of uh, eligibility to take the required exams um, and what is necessary if um, there's new missing some information that they need to submit to us um, in order to uh, complete that step in the licensure process. Um, so these templates already reviewed um, by the committee uh, at their uh, July meeting last year, and then it was presented to the board for feedback as well at the August um, board meeting at that time. Um, at the board meeting um, in August, Dr. Cervantes and Dr. Hopsheets were tasked by the board um, to work with staff um, to further improve these templates. And so with the guidance and additional feedback provided, um, staff made further amendments, uh, mostly to restructure and make some um, clarifying information um, about the licensure process and to uh, communicate it uh, through the templates. And then these templates are um, included in attachment A. Um, additionally, uh, staff also worked with uh, Mr. Brady Oppenheim uh, from the Office of Publications, uh, Design and Editing of the Department of Consumer Affairs. He was very helpful to help us um, in creating new resources about the licensure and examination process. And these new resources are um, an illustration on how to qualify for a psychology license, as well as a flow chart on uh, how to apply for a license. Um, these new resources are already posted on the board website, which um, everybody can access through the links. Um, the links uh, also provide the link is also provided on the memo uh, for convenience. And then uh, we are here to ask uh, the committee to um, provide any feedback if um, you might have, and we are happy to answer any questions. And please let us know if you um, if the committee would like me kind of walk through the um, templates as well. Um, Dr. Tate and um, Ms. Nystrom, uh, would you like Ms. Chung to walk through them? I know we saw them at a board meeting um, and 
that or any questions or comments that you would have? Can Ms. Chang, can you just briefly walk through them for everyone? Yes, of course. Um, so in the attachment A, you'll find the corresponding templates. So we included um, the uh, approval and deficiency notice for each step, which are um, the e P mm -hmm. uh, application and then the uh, applic and then the process uh, for requesting the complete and also the very last step after they have passed the exams um, and coming to us requesting for their initial license for psychologist. Uh, so you will see uh, in the templates, uh, for example, in the HPOP approval, we have restructured um, these templates um, to include headings to make very clear um, where they are at with the process. For example, we clearly state that that if they are approved, then this is mm -hmm. um, that they are approved, and then we provide um, the next step, uh, how to schedule and register what they need to expect um, in the process. And they will also provide additional information, uh, including uh, these links, kind of make it um, uh, structurally in a better way um, to make it stand out for the information so that easy to look for those information if the applicant needs to refer um, to them. For example, um, an FAQ about the registration portal that was um, handled by um, the ASPPB. And there are some how-to videos and then email uh, contact info if they have any technical uh, issues, if they're registering through the portal, things like that. And then we also uh, incorporated the feedback, um, making more clear on the exam accommodation process, what form they need to fill out and what to expect. Uh, we uh, highlighted um, the expiration of application because um, this information is very important for the applicants because eligibility is set uh, in regulations and the application will expire along with the eligibility period if no action is taken uh, for the exam. So we make sure that this information fairly clearly labeled what they are. And then we added additional information for um, when the applicant they decide to take the exam on their time, you know, uh, because the scheduling of exam relies on applicants. They don't schedule with us, they schedule with um, the vendor directly. Uh, and then so we kind of tell them that, okay, if they pass, uh, what would they need to do to go to the next step of the licensure process? And then what happened, what, what else they would need to do if they haven't passed yet and how to continue with the process. And then we also, include um, any information that they would need. So for example, some of the applicants would submit additional um, information to us, for example, uh, some pre-licensure coursework requirements. And then so we will also review them and let them know that, okay, these are any pending licensure requirements for your licensure process um, in the end. So they can, they are made aware from the get-go what else is needed for them. For example, if they're missing coursework or um, then they will have to submit the coursework verification to us down the road. Um, and then we let them know about um, the processing times uh, um, that they can refer back to uh, on our website as well. So, and then the same goes on for the other, uh, other uh, correspondent templates. We kind of follow uh, the same pattern for that. Can I just add one thing to Ms. Chung? Um, I know we talked about maybe adding the flow chart, a reference to the flow chart in the beginning of this EPPP approval emails so that it will also give them a visual representation um, as well as this written representation of the process that they will be going through. Yes, that's a very good idea. Thank you, Dr. Hapsheet. Uh, we can um, add that to the paragraph uh, just under um, file ID number where it says you are now approved. We're thinking um, adding it at the second sentence, kind of uh, the link, for example, we will say uh, see the flowchart. Uh, we include the link to the flowchart for information so that they will know exactly where they are since we talked about that this is where they are at for the first step towards licensure at the HRPP approval. Great, thank you.
Absolutely. This is, this is Dr. Tate. These documents are so clear. I, I really appreciate all of the hard work of staff and Drs. Harpsheet and Cervantes. They look so much better than they did before. And they really kind of, I like how the bold highlights the pertinent information. So I appreciate it. And they look great to me. Yes, it, it is a really excellent understanding and how helpful. If, I wish we had had that when I was going through licensing. Um, it, you know, it's, it's they're great reference documents too, and and very respectful of the process and the applicants going through the process. I believe. Um, Ms. Nystrom, did you want to add anything? Any comments? Um, there were just there were just two things that I was um, wanting to um, to ask on the CPLI approval uh, form. Um, Kind of in the first header there, it says this email is to notify you. And then in the last sentence, it says you will receive an email communication from PSI of your eligibility. I was wondering if it would be helpful to um, to expand out uh, that PSI is the uh, Psychological Services Inc. or whatever the official name is. I know I noticed in the flow chart below that it expands the name um, and I just wonder um, for a non-practitioner, I had to look to see what PSI was referring to um, and if that would be helpful or not. Um, and then under the CPLI deficiencies, one of the bullet points um, noted that it's not required um, with the SPE outside of California. Um, and I was curious if it doesn't penalize, uh, you know, California. I mean, if you don't have to get that certification, if you go outside, I guess I was just a little bit confused if why you don't have to have the certification if you get it outside of California, but you do if you get it inside of California. Oh, thank you, Ms. Nystrom. Yes, so regarding your first comment, yes, we can uh, expand that uh, acronym. So if it's PSI, I think that will make good clarification uh, for whoever's reading it. So thank you for that uh, suggestions. We incorporate that. And then um, regarding your second questions on supervision agreement, um, because a supervision agreement is um, a requirement set for the uh, uh, experience earned in California and then so um, they're not required for if an uh, individual started their schooling or education training outside the state it was something that is required of them as long as they are complying with the um, uh, 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 governing laws and regulations under that jurisdictions that they're accruing hours for okay that 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 clarifies that okay thank you so much I appreciate no problem Okay. Um, well, let's open the comment box for any public comment on these documents. This is the moderator. The Q&A is now open. The instructions are on the screen. If you would like to participate and you're logged in, you can press the question mark inside of the square, typically bottom right corner of your WebEx screen, and type in comment in the text field and send that to all panelists, and then we will call on you um, to provide your verbal comment. If you are calling in, press star three from your phone. That will raise your virtual hand and then we will call on you um, to give your verbal comment. At this time, I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Okay. We will move on to um, item agenda item number seven, and this is the examination for professional practice in psychology, ECCP2 status. So I will report on that. The um, ASPPB board has voted to make the ECCP now a two-part exam, and this will be in effect of January 1st, 2026. So it will still be called the ECCP. There will be part one and part two. Um, our board has established an ad hoc committee to study this issue. And that committee will meet on April 28th of this year. 
the committee will then report to the full board uh, at the May 19th, 2023 meeting, which at this time is scheduled to be a virtual meeting. That's all the information we have at this point. I think in the next board um, newsletter, and Ms. Sorek, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there will be a little bit uh, more um, information about how we came to this or how ASPPB came to decide that this um, part two would be a necessary component to prepare someone for licensure. The idea is the part one is the knowledge part and part two would be a skills part. Um, if anybody else on the committee or staff would like to make any additional comments, please do so. Ms. Sorek. Hi. Hi, Dr. Herbsheets. Uh, just a, an extra note that um, an article will be forthcoming. Um, in the, I believe it's March, uh, is when the spring newsletter uh, will be going out. And Dr. Kasuga uh, will be writing an article on a little background on the EPPP and the evolution of the issue. And then a reminder about the um, EPPP ad hoc committee, which you mentioned on April 28th, which will be brought uh, to a full board discussion on May 18th. Thank you. Is it the 18th or the 19th? Or is it a two day meeting? So it will be one, one or the other. It is a one day meeting and I thought it was May 18th, but let me just confirm. It's the 19th. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's open the box for any public comment on this item, the EPPP2. This is the moderator. The Q&A is now open. Instructions are on the screen. If you would like to participate, click the question mark inside of the square, bottom right corner of your WebEx screen, and type comment in the text field and send it to all panelists. If you are calling in, press star three to raise your virtual hand. At this time, no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, please do. Okay, um, item number eight, recommendations for agenda items for future licensure committee meetings. Do any of our committee members have any recommendations? This is Ms. Nystrom, Ben here. I don't have any either. Okay, Dr. Tate, thank you. Um, please open the comment box in case any of our um, people who are listening in have any recommendations for future meetings. This is the moderator. If you would like to participate in the Q&A, you can press question mark inside of the square, type comments, send it to all panelists. Those who are calling in, press star three. All of that, inst the instructions are on the screen for your reference. <laughs> No request for public comments. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Please do. This concludes the agenda for the open session of today's licensure committee meeting. We will now meet in closed session to discuss and consider qualifications for licensure. And as a reminder that at the conclusion of closed session, we will only reconvene to adjourn the meeting. It is 1148, so- Oh, Dr. Harpsheets, yeah. really quick. I apologize for interrupting. I just wanna clarify that uh, the changes that were suggested uh, today in the licensure committee meeting uh, will be made and uh, will be part of the licensure committee report for the February 2nd and 3rd meeting. I just wanted to add that in for clarification. Sure, I apologize. Thank you. Sure, thanks. I, and I see Ms. McCochran has her hand up. 
Hi, yes, I just wanted to uh, go back to the question we received earlier regarding um, if you attend the committee or board meeting and you leave early, how many hours would you uh, receive? Um, yeah, so because we also can confirm it on our attendance report, um, you would just receive the amount of hours that you stayed. So if you only stayed for an hour, you would put in one hour. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, add that for those who call in, uh, if you could just get, uh, email me, the email address is bopce at dca.ca.gov. Uh, just email me your name and the number that you used to call in, and then I can keep that for our records. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Oh, Ms. Nystrom, I see. All right, Ms. McCorkin, will you respond to uh, any of the callers today just to verify um, that you received their email, or how will they know that that, uh, that, that was received? Yes, I will respond um, respond back to their email to let them know I've received it. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Anyone else before we end? And so it, since it's now 1150, that would, uh, those of you who are looking for CPD credit for this meeting, there would be um, two hours of credit. Um, I see somebody has their hand up uh, wanting to make a comment uh, or have has a question. Um, can we take that question, Ms. Marks, at this point in the meeting? Uh, you uh, can take that question in my opinion, if the board has the time to do the committee, I'm sorry, has the time to do it, but I would open it up to uh, other people as well. If you want to continue with public comment, you don't have to, but if you want to reopen it, you can. Okay. Well, we have a few minutes, so let's reopen the public comment box and then we can also begin with the question, the hand whose who's hand is up now. This is the moderator. The Q&A is now open. Instructions are on the screen. I'm going to send a request to unmute Zoe Dori. Dori sorry, I apologize. I'm mispronouncing the name here. Um, microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. No, I just, uh, thank you. I just want I was going to say thanks for mentioning at the end that we received two hours and we can check out because I, I, at the end will be just to say goodbye, no? Yes. When yes. you guys come back, I mean, we'd love right, to hear right, the right. rest, but it sounds like there's no purpose to it. Yes. So and thanks two, for making this amendment today of announcing how many uh, hours uh, we can get so we don't have discrepancies. I appreciate that. Sure, thank you. And and that and just to clarify, um, it would be two hours if you signed on right at 10 o'clock. But you know, from what Ms. McCochran was sharing with us, that let's say you signed on later than 10 o'clock, then it would just be the hours that you were present for. And we'll get that information directly from the unit that provides that solid to solid is the acronym. So, but if you signed on at 10 and it's 11.52, you can count two hours. No, oh, I, sign, I signed in before. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. 